those of you who don't know, I'm going to do a brief plug. This is Open Access Week. I do hope that that's been in your diaries all year, and if it hasn't, you know, get it in now because it'll be the same week next year. There's been absolutely massive, massive amounts of things going on. Um, the importance of open access in the kind of conversations that we're having here is that it's a facilitator of the types of things that APA seeks to do, which is to make, make knowledge available. Um, and that's why I'm so fascinated to work with APA at um, forums like this and, um, and other initiatives. Um, so I'm really delighted to be able to uh, facilitate this, this first session. Um, and the title of it is Open Knowledge and the Public Interest Issues and Strategies. And we've got three speakers, so I'll introduce them when they come up, but essentially we cover the university sector, open government sector, um, and the not-for-profit. And they're going to talk about um, initiatives within their area, strategies uh, that have worked, and um, some um, things that we've learnt, they've learned from that. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, so get your questions um, uh, kind of out now. So first of all, I'm what, delighted to welcome Gwenda Thomas from the University of Melbourne. So Gwenda is the um, Director of Scholarly Services and University Librarian at the University of Melbourne. University of Melbourne is a great supporter of the Australasian and Nexus Strategy Group, so really delighted with that. And she was previously the Executive Director at the University of Cape Town Libraries in South Africa, where one of the many things that she did there was actually to develop an open access policy and um, uh, procedures for that. So she's going to talk to us about uh, uh, the, the open educational resources in particular. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity. As you can hear, I am South African, so I will try to speak, project in such a way that um, I don't know if it's um, understandable. Sometimes I see people frown at me, and then I know if I'm not making any sense. So, But I'm, I'm an advocate of, of open access, and particularly around knowledge and making it available for people in the education sector. Am I audible at the back? Can you, can you hear me at the back? Not so well. Is that better? So I'm going to just very briefly today cover something that's very close to my heart, and that is about open education resources. And what are the big issues? What needs to change? And what can we do to make that happen? And the topic I was given was to talk or think about in the area of, of social um, justice and equity. So as I say, this is something that is some close to my heart, and Ginny said to us, be provocative. Well, that's not difficult to do in this area of open access, because <coughs> social justice, equity, and inclusion are very noble themes, but the case for the open textbooks in the global south is not so noble, and not a lot of progress has been made in this regard. And I don't think open access, for all that's been done in this area, has fully delivered on its potential as an anchor for educational reform in the global south. And when I talk about the global south, I'm talking about Africa, South America, Asia, the Middle East, and even Australia. Are our open access pl platforms really able to ensure inclusive, equitable, and collaborative platforms that can advance educational transformation? There's been a lot of focus on research outputs. That is really where open access gained its traction in the education sector, but much less so around things like um, the open education resources and specifically the open <coughs> digital textbook. So the big challenge I think that we've got to be thinking about is how we're going to address the imbalance of knowledge and power in the scholarship landscape and, towards, and working towards equitable access. So why is this an issue? First of all, the, the equity and social justice essentially is about fair and inclusive access to learning and community resources. And I think this forum today where you are about policy and it's about making knowledge and information available to communities, it goes beyond that because if people in the first instance in the learning and early education and later on in, their, in, in a tertiary education can't get access to learning materials, then they're not going to have much success as adults out there in the workplace. So just very briefly, social justice is about promotion of a just society and it's about challenging injustice. And this will become apparent when I talk about what happened in South Africa and why open textbooks have become such an important issue about which people were ready to go to the protest front and to take on an unjust system in the country. 
It's about the ways in which resources are allocated to the citizenry by social institutions. Education and information are included as essential resources. And the International Forum for Social Democracy links inequalities in the distribution of access to knowledge. And it's also a human right. And the president of the Mellon Foundation says, it's talking about open access. Pub public publicness is its great strength. But there are power relations in scholarship and information. And in 2015, and, or between 2015 and 2017, in South Africa, we had rolling social activism on our campuses to the point that almost the education sector was ground to a halt, the higher education sector. It was framed by a movement called Roads Must Fall and one called Fees Must Fall. And it was about students' lived experiences, not only in the education sector, but in their homes and in their lives as well. It was about the exclusionary structures of col colonization that obstruct access to knowledge. It was about the negative impact of unaffordable textbooks published predominantly in the global north and sold back to us in these areas. Very often the research is done in our countries, it's packaged up, it's taken back to the global north, it's repackaged and sold back to us at unaffordable prices. And the students took to, took to the streets around this. They saw scholarship through the lens of social justice and there were demands to decolonize the curriculum and so much has been written about that and really what it means and I think um, Howard alluded to it in the very last sentence where he was talking about Senegal, that issue about localizing scholarship in the context of the countries to which it is relevant. So there were demands, this part of the, the, um, the roads must fall about the slow pace of transformation were demands for local teaching and learning materials to be available in the curriculum. Learning materials that reflected their indigenous issues and subjects relevant to the global south. It wasn't to say the global north research or context isn't relevant, but it has to be contextualized and your own knowledge and scholarship has to reflect in that contextualization. Students wanted indigenous knowledge and scholarship to be visible, discernible, and accessible in the classroom. They wanted to recover the silent voices of their great scholars missing from the current curricula, the philosophers, the artists, the thought leaders from Africa, Asia, Middle East. You get a very Eurocentric view when you start taking textbooks and you're bringing them into the country. So a basic human right was access to information and it was central in this quest for justice. Students demanded a more inclusive approach in the creation and distribution of free online teaching and learning material, particularly textbooks. The horrendous costs impacted by volatile currency, and we're seeing that in Australia now as the currency is fluctuating, how it's impacting on access to knowledge. In South Africa, there were very arcane laws that prohibit the importation of cheaper editions from elsewhere in the world if we were already importing from America or the UK. New tools to democratize access to educational context became a very strong mantra and open access really started to become a, a question on the table. So how do we liberate the textbook? How do we redress and provide equitable access to knowledge and learning? Open textbooks have a trans transformative role to play in decreasing knowledge divides in society. In South Africa, for instance, as an example, the government was prepared to fund academics at UCT to write a textbook around constitutional law. The first opposition we got was from a very highly um, well-respected and established researcher who had his own research group around constitutional law. And as you know, South Africa's constitution is regarded as one of the most progressive in the world. And the question to him was, but what happens to basic 101 constitutional law? The material and the terms that you put out are inaccessible. They're published by Princeton. They're published by you know, Stanford University. So we took them on in this law faculty and we got government funding and academics were then released from their day-to-day -day teaching to write essentially a 101 textbook in constitutional law. And that will be made available to the country because the national government has put funding into it. We've also got a, a, a medical uh, doctor who is an ENT specialist. I've put his, his real um, subject. <laughs> it's essentially, it's ear, nose, and throat specialization. But he has, for years, 
On the African continent, been producing together with editors and colleagues around the world who write the chapters and have created an interactive digital textbook that is used by surgeons in Kenya on the continent who don't have access to uh, published materials and they use the interactive textbooks in surgery to assist them. This particular volume, which was on, uh, we were doing as part of an open publishing platform, has something like 500,000 downloads per annum. I think he touched a million at one point. And those are highly respected surgeons who just want to transform the way the medical um, information is made available. I'd like to say you have an excellent example right here in Australia, the Australian uh, National University Press. They have an e-text publishing initiated in 2014. And the DVC for Academic has a fund to which academics can apply for $10,000 per annum, which then basically buys them um, the opportunity that they can bring in uh, teachers to, to help them in the classroom and that they can then write um, open digital textbooks which are available. And that, for me, is the way we need to, to go. I think it is an excellent model. They have a, um, a business plan and a strategy. So my question is, how can we make a difference? To what extent are we actually putting ourselves out there to design equitable foundations for access to learning content across the global south? How can we advance the potential to support local knowledge, sharing and contextualised curricula? And in Africa we have a saying, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, uh, go far and you want to make a difference, you go together. And that's what I think open access is about. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Gwenda. That's a fantastically provocative presentation for us to kick off with. So I'm not going to take, we're not going to take questions now. We're going to hold them for the end, and we'll do the panel at the end. Um, but please have a think about some of the issues that were raised there. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, doc, uh, the Honourable Dr Ken Coggill, who previously uh, a, um, MP in the Victorian Legislative Assembly, um, the director of several not-for-profit organisations, but the chair of the Australian Open Government Partnership Network. So. Um, he's an associate professor at Monash University, leading research teams specialising in governance and parliamentary studies. And he's going to talk to us about the role of um, the Open Government Partnership, which is an international um, alliance and a uh, very different perspective on these issues. So thank you very much, Ken. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk uh, about the Open Government Partnership, which is a relatively new initiative. Uh, so these are the key points which I'll be covering. I won't uh, uh, read them out. But uh, this is the model which I see as the context that we're in. So th this is a fairly uh, conventional uh, breakup of society into the three social sectors. And the important thing about them is the interactions which occur be between actors, uh, both individual and institutional actors, in each of them, and that's where openness becomes really important. The, the basic structure, of course, is regulated by the state, by, by government, and what's really important about government is the, is the public trust principle. In other words, people in government, whether public servants or politicians, uh, premiers or ministers, have a responsibility as trustees for the public trust, the things which the community uh, owns collectively, has responsibility for collectively. So that's the, the context in which I'll be talking about the uh, Open Government Partnership. So um, this is the current membership of the Open Government Partnership. It was uh, the, the coloured ones. It was started in 2011. It was an in initiative of uh, a wide range, a small but wide range of countries. So that you can see that Indonesia, for example, is there as a member. It was one of the initial inaugural members, uh, as was the United States and, uh, and the United Kingdom, Obama and David Cameron in particular. Uh, so they are the, the ones who started this off. Uh, and the basis on which they started was a, 
a, an assertion, uh, I don't say it's necessarily strongly based by evidence, but an assertion that open government leads to better outcomes in a society. Uh, that, that's the basic premises on which they proceeded. So the sorts of uh, things that are happening under the Open Government Partnership, I should mention that countries join by way of a decision of the national executive government. Uh, so it's not a parliamentary decision, it's a decision by the executive. And, the, <coughs> and in signing up to it, each country uh, to set, commits themselves to one of these, or to all of these four commitments which I mentioned. So the first is about access to information about what's happening within government and information held by government, not only within government, uh, dealing with government's own activities. Uh, secondly, there's a very strong support for civic participation, uh, public participation, if you like. And uh, also very important is improvement in integrity of government. And one of the key debates in Australia in that context is whether there should be a federal ICAC. And I'll come back to that. Uh, and the final one is increasing access to the use of technology for uh, openness and accountability. The countries then execute their membership in this way. Firstly, they engage civil society in the design, preparation, implementation and monitoring, and that's over two-year cycles. So Australia has just completed its first two-year cycle, and the way in which this particular part is implemented is through what's known as the Open Government Forum, which is a forum of 16 members, and those 16 members are half representing government, in this case in the form of deputy secretaries of departments, so not politicians directly, but people who've certainly got the ear and the, the view of the politician, uh, of the uh, ministerial politicians involved. And the other half are civil society representatives. Well, not representatives in the formal sense, but people who come from a civil society background. And I've been one of those for the last two years. So the annual, uh, sorry, the biannual action plan then is co-created by the Open Government Forum. And the final stage then is for the government in practice the cabinet, it doesn't go beyond the cabinet, who approve and submit the uh, action plan. And the next thing which I haven't put on the slide here but is really important is that during the implementation phase there is an independent reporting mechanism. So a, a form of external evaluation of what's been done by way of the development of particular commitments and the way in which those commitments have then been implemented. So it's an independent process, independent of the executive government. In Australia's case, it's uh, executed by Daniel Stewart, who's a lawyer in the uh, ANU Law School. This is the first batch of commitments in the first action plan, the first national action plan. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I would draw your attention in particular to the uh, integrity in the public sector and 4.2. And 4.2 is an example of where there has been a real tussle between civil society members of the Open Government Forum and government on the other side of it. Government has been very reluctant to countenance the idea of the national integrity framework, including uh, what we use as shorthand, uh, a federal ICAC, in other words, a federal anti-corruption body. So at the end of the first period, which has just concluded, all we got from, uh, all we could get government to agree to was to keep under review options for improving the integrity framework within Australia. But there was uh, quite strong resistance to any suggestion that Australia needed a new body, anti-corruption body. This is uh, the second national action plan commitments which have only just been 
uh, adopted and reported to the Open Government Forum, uh, which is based in Washington. Again, you see here that the first of them is dealing with the National Integrity Framework. And again, the commitment that has been uh, accepted for this second reporting period is a very modest one. It keeps open the possibility of a new body, a new anti-corruption body, to uh, be implemented within Australia at the federal level, but it certainly makes no commitment to it. And we, are from the civil society side of it, think that it's actually very important. And just to illustrate the point, the present federal arrangement is through uh, for dealing with uh, allegations of corruption is through a body called ACLI. Now ACLI is empowered to investigate allegations in specified public service areas. Those public service areas are some fairly obvious ones like customs and, and the like, but they do not include defence and defence procurement. And you'd be aware that internationally, defence procurement is one of the areas where there are the most serious examples of corrupt conduct. And here in Australia, we've got the example of the submarine contract, which has been led to a French company, which is on the record of having bribed public officials in other countries in order to secure contracts. And the same applies to their military vehicles, the Hawkeye military vehicles about which there's been a bit of controversy recently following a report by the Australian Auditor General. So that is an example, uh, pro defence procurement then, is an example of where there has been contention between civil society and government as to what sort of commitment should be made under this open government partnership. Now, as I was saying, the understanding is that there are significant advantages from open government, and these can be summarised in these uh, particular examples which I give here. So, in, in the one hand, it's about trust, and it's not just about trust by the public in government, it's about government actually trusting the public <coughs> to be involved in decision making. And that flows from the public trust principle. In other words, ministers and public servants have a responsibility as trustees for the public trust. Support for public participation is one of the things that Australia signed up to, but it's also one of the things that I would have to say the Commonwealth Public Service is very weak on, and there's very little enthusiasm within the public service, other than in the Department of Industry, which is quite good on it, for in extending public participation and using it in the way that it's successfully been done in local government and state governments around Australia. Another point, of course, which is important is that in involving members of the community, there needs to be equity, equal power, if you like, in the influence, the opportunity that is available to people throughout the community. So that if we take the Murray-Darling Basin, for example, the, it shouldn't be the interests of the irrigators which are uh, prevailing over those who are concerned about uh, uh, downstream effects, including environmental effects. And the final point about involving the community is that it has to be at the level of deliberation, not simply going to the community and asking, well, what's your opinion on option A or option B? Now, what's clear from the way in which the Open Government Partnership is operating in Australia is that we have not yet, at least in the Australian example of it, entered the, evolu the evidence revolution that Howard was speaking about. So I think that that's one of the really important lessons that needs to be taken on board and uh, applied in this second period of, the, of Australia's membership of the Open Government Partnership, and that will include preparation of proposals for the third National Action Plan from 2020 onwards. So, thank you for your interest.
Okay, thank you very much, Ken. That was fascinating. It's a very, very different field, very different uh, perspective, and that, that's kind of what we want to bounce off and get um, get the dis panel discussion going on about. Um, okay, all right. So our last speaker for this session is uh, turning again to a different, a completely different area. Is um, in the not-for-profit sector. Karen Maylab, Maylab, is that from that? Marlab. Marlab apologies. Um, the CEO and founder of Pro Bono Australia, which is I'm delighted to meet her because that's a great resource that I used when I first came to Australia. I found it really fascinating. Um, she was appointed a member of the Order of Australia in uh, 2015 for a contribution to the not-for-profit sector, and she's uh, chair of the advisory committee at Swinburne <coughs> University of Technology Social Innovation Research Institute. And so she's going to talk to us about public interest journalism. Um, so I guess where I come in um, and listening to the wonderful discussions that have happened before is um, we have the research, we have the evidence, we have an evidence of the evidence and we've measured the evidence and then how do we tell people what the evidence is and how do we get them to engage. So I guess that's what Pro Bono Australia is, we're a hub, a platform for information and to, for people to know what the evidence is. Um, and to talk about the evidence. So I started Pro Bono Australia in 1999, um, really coming out of publishing um, and wanting to work in an organisation for purpose. And it was really before the beginning of the purpose boom um, and created an um, organisation that wanted to bring, at that point, the benefits of new technology to the community <coughs> sector. So how would the community sector find out about the wonderful things that were happening in IT that would help the not-for-profit se sector talk about and leverage what they do? So um, at that point, I created Pro Bono Australia, which today is a hub for the community sector. Um, we have, hold on, how do I go? Do I press forward that? Is it here? Oh, sorry. Um, as you can see, we're a hub for, um, at the front end, most people would know about our news, but we have jobs online. We have a place where people can volunteer and be matched up with volunteering opportunities. We have um, a guide to giving, a source guide, events, education through the webinars. So it's a whole resource, um, resource portal. And I'll get to the point of that at the moment. So what we basically do is make knowledge available. Okay, so we're about activating good intentions. We dedicate our time, energy and resources to support and enable the growth of an engaged and effective for good sector. So we deal with a, a number of different areas that I call the social economy, civil society and not-for-profit organisations are one of them. Um, so is philanthropy, so is volunteering, so are not-for-profit organisations, so is co um, uh, corporate social responsibility and this incredible growing area called impact investing, which is investing for social good as, financial, as well as financial return. Oh. We have a million people a year using our services. We have a huge range of um, 50,000 subscribers to our new services. Um, and this is not just about us, I'm getting to a point, um, about um, information. We have a whole range of um, social media outlets that we use to inform and engage our readership. And over time, we have um, become a trusted source for information. So much so um, that we're not just a media organisation telling people what's happening, we're actually going out and engaging people to tell us what they feel about sector issues, what they feel um, is important to the sector. So on various issues, we research our subscriber base. Civil Voices was one of them, um, where we decided to research how not-for-profits were feeling about the right, their right and ability to advocate. There's been a lot of talk about um, charities being stripped of their DGR status if they spoke out for the issues that they were in, um, in charge of. And we wanted to document 
how that had changed over time and how not-for-profits were feeling about that. So we partnered with the Human Rights Law Centre. We got a philanthropist to fund the Human Rights Law Centre to employ us as a media organisation with Melbourne University doing the research to project out the results that came from the survey. So it was really a four-part partnership with us being the voice out to the sector at the end of it. So the research did sit on its own on a website. We were actually able to activate. And I have to say that even now, a year down the line after this has been done, I'm getting calls from not-for-profits and peak bodies all around Australia saying, come and talk to us because our members are hesitant about speaking about the, about the issues that they're engaged with. And this research gave them courage. So um, we also do something called Impact 25, which is highlighting the people in the sector who make an impact, getting the community that sits around Pro Bono Australia to tell, nominate who they think has made an impact in the sector. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of people. We had 21,000 people voting and hundreds of thousands of views of um, the project. Um, and we measure our impact. So even though we're, we started as what, even then social enterprise wasn't, when I started in 1999, wasn't a term that people used. I called us a social purpose business venture and now the word social enterprise. So we decided even as a, um, a we're a for purpose organisation, so we do sit in a commercial model, but we thought we'd measure our impact and our impact has come out for four of our product lines at 11 to one, which is astonishing. So. So in 2017, Pro Bono had a little bit of a hiccup and I thought we might disappear. And what occurred to me is we've got through that, we're fine, um, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, but what occurred to me is if we disappear, then the voice of the not-for-profit sector disappears. And what really came home to me was the importance of media the importance of the different voices of the different communities that different media organisations represent. And um, there is a great concern about what's happening to media at the moment. If, if we disappeared, pretty much the voice of the not-for-profit sector in Australia would disappear. But that is happening across Australia. It's happening now at a rural and regional level. Um, so a small group of us have got together to form now what's called the Public Interest Journalism Initiative. This is new, it's not been launched yet. It'll be launched in about a month. We're just um, <coughs> finalising our details. Um, but it's in response to this diminution of um, media voices in Australia. I'm just going to go... So many of you um, won't realise that... Um, Really, what kept journalists afloat in our newspapers was the classified advertising at the back. So we had jobs and classifieds. That has all gone online. So the money at the back of the newspapers that used to pay for journalists who wrote has decreased by 72%. So there's not been enough money to employ the journalists at the front. So what we're seeing is a decrease in the number of journalists writing on court reporting, on arts, on different sector issues, the numbers of reporters and newspapers viable in rural and regional areas. And we all know that having a robust media is vital to an informed democracy. It's vital to informing the public to be able to participate deliberately in democracy. Um, so public interest journalism sheds light in dark places, holds authority to account and reports the information the public is entitled to know. It's a critical pillar of Australia democracy, but our media is in crisis. Um, business models are collapsing, authenticity is declining. Benign takeover of Fairfax Entertainment. Um, we don't know what's going to happen to the Fairfax mastheads. We do know that the rural and regional Fairfax papers are in trouble. We don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, we need a powerful voice to mobilise public concern and shape the policies redressed where public interest journalism in Australia. And this is what the Public Interest Journalism Initiative does. 
3,000 journalists have lost their jobs. Um, it's We've got far less reliable journalism because the journalists who are left on the publications are, re are relying on PR releases rather than investigating their own news. So the quality of our news is declining and we don't know where those PR releases are coming from in terms of who's paid for them. Um, our coverage of our politics, court, state and local government um, is being scaled and dumbed down. Even more highly concentrated media ownership structures endangers a diversity of voices, views and stories. And in Australia, unfortunately, we've got <coughs> one of the most highly concentrated media ownerships in the world. So um, whilst 11 inquiries are being held into the future of Australian journalism, we don't know the way forward yet. And that's what the public interest journalism is attempting to do. So I've got no time. So. What we're doing is we're going to be doing research into what needs to be known about public interest journalism and how it's affecting our democracy. We hope to develop some sustainable um, funding streams that will support new models of journalism which need to happen. We need to reinvent, the media needs to reinvent how we do journalism and develop sustainable revenue streams. It can't be reliant on funding, it can't be reliant on philanthropy. Um, we need to build the research that shows that and shows what works um, and we need to affect policy changes. So for example at the moment in Australia media organisations cannot be charities, cannot get DGR status and yet Joanne McCarthy at the Newcastle Herald was the one that, under, um, that found out about sexual abuse in institutions and caused the Royal Commissions. That kind of public, in, um, public interest journalism is absolutely fundamental and if those people aren't there in media organisations, we're in trouble. So um, we formed a small group of people. I'm happy to announce Glyn Davis, who's um, ex-Melbourne University, has now come on the board. Eric Beecher is on the board, Adam Ferrier, um, Marilyn Warren, who's not up here, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in Victoria, has agreed to come on the board. And we formed this organisation that will now um, push for, um, to shine a spotlight on this issue of public interest journalism in Australia. So I completely agree with Ken that deliberate, you need deliberation, you need evidence, you need deliberation at a community level and we need the networks, we need the media to be able to broadcast what that is and spread the word. Thank you. Great, thank you, Karen. That was that's really fascinating. I think that's a, an amazing emerging initiative. So I, I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions about that. So, um, in the interest of we've got um, till eleven o'clock. Is that correct? correct? I might go a little bit over that because we did start a bit late. Yeah. So we've got to about fifteen minutes for questions. Um, what I'm going to can I take the first one as the chair, and then I will open it up to everybody, which is really outrageous. Um, I just. <laughs> I, I feel like we've, we've had some of this in the questions that, that in the presentations already, but could each of you perhaps think about one major barrier to implementation that you had at, you talk in each of your areas that you know if you could move it away, what would be the thing, one thing that you would say would help you know for example the textbooks that would actually get them implemented better? What's the one thing that you'd like if you had a wish list that you could uh, you could wave a wand about? So I'll start I'll start with Brenda. Is the mic picking up? Yeah, it's a little bit too far away from me now. Does that help? Yep, yep, that's great. I think it's the intelligence of the publishers that is the, the issue of the textbooks, and they really have no interest at all about the cost of the textbook, who the risk about access to content and knowledge. And I think the only way we're going to do it is to change our mindsets within the universities. It has to be driven by the academics who want to share and make um, textbooks that reflect a more local context uh, within a global setting, but, um, and also within the universities to give the academics the, the, the means and the time to be able to take off to, to write and to make the, the, um, the content available. 
much as well a direct relationship with the students. They're not even interested in libraries licensing uh, textbooks for students. They basically want to bypass that. They want the direct relationship. They want to sell the textbook direct to the student. Great. Okay. Yes. Uh, is this working okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm a bit of a fundamentalist, I suppose. And it strikes me that for our social system, our socio-political system to operate well, it needs the public trust principle to be actually accepted and applied by uh, the decision makers in our society, the councillors, the ministers, the prime ministers and premiers. And at the moment it's treated as a common law principle that by and large is not just justiciable. So my view is that the most important and fundamental thing that needs to happen is for a much wider acceptance of the necessity of observing the public trust principle. Great. Karen. Um, I think we need to have a policy environment and a willingness to um, support public interest journalism in Australia, um, given that the model has really um, is in trouble. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. All right. Uh, so I'll call on people. Could you in, could you just say who you are briefly when you when you introduce yourself and wait for the microphone because it's all being recorded. Okay. Chapman's hand up. Yep. Uh, my name is David Bruce. I'm a member of the Public Records Advisory Council here in Victoria. We advise the people of Public Records on all aspects of records management. Uh, there have been a lot of agendas and there will be more agendas expressed today. But clearly, uh, from my point of view, uh, there's no point in having talking about open access if you don't have proper records management facilities in place. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's been no interaction between records management and the archives, the national archives, and the state of territory archives in relation to this discussion on open access. I spoke to the office yesterday, they haven't even heard about the seminar. Uh, it's a question for Ken. Um, uh, in, the, in the light of the uh, pending review of the Public Records Act in Victoria, um, how best do you think that uh, public records legislation uh, and records management um, activity at the government level uh, can be developed to ensure that open access principles are absorbed into that area? Well, uh, there is the opportunity to use the open government partnership in that way. Uh, the, at the federal level, the archives people have been involved in the uh, open government forum. Now, I don't say that it's necessarily led to a major reform at this stage, but there is the opportunity <coughs> under the Open Government Partnership to extend it to the sub-national level. So one of the things that I'll be advocating for the forthcoming period is for Victoria to pick it up and apply it in cases like the uh, public records. Great. Thanks. Another question? Oh, hi. My name's Carol. I'm from the University. Ken, I'm really interested in that public trust thing, especially the fact that the government needs to trust the public more. So I guess my question maybe is then to Karen, what ideas or strategies do you have to really engender more of that um, trust from the government to the public? Because often there's a devaluing of other kinds of knowledge and expertise that occur outside of the government and academic schemes. Sorry, what is the... How can, how can we, um, I guess, support people from the government side to have greater trust in the public? Because often there's, that's what Ken was saying, there's the two sides to the public trust principle. It's one thing to say to the public, they yeah, trust us with the government, but often the government then doesn't trust the public to make, as we had involved decision making, have those delivery processes, maybe because they're not the experts, they won't give us the answers we want, or you know, weigh the evidence by the sceptical, or whatever those concerns are, things that stop the government from trusting. I'm, I'm really not an expert in government. I've got to say it's the only area that I'm, I'm uh, well, not the only area, but um, <laughs> an area that I'm not um, particularly familiar with. I know, I know the other, the other way. Um, there's a complete disconnect between um, what the public thinks and what they see happening at a government level um, at the moment. So, um, how could the government more? Um, more adequately trust the public is, um, I think, at a, I've, I've seen some really good things around deliberative democracy at a local level, um, how local councils have proper conversations with their constituents and how at a fairly radical um, level, um, local, and I've seen this overseas, how 
um, local at a local area, constituents can <coughs> even vote on how a local government spends their budget. So those kind of processes to see um, at what level um, governments could intersect with the population that sits probably more at a local level rather than at a national level where elections are, are that process. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Can I just come in there with a, a couple of examples uh, which are, are quite local? Uh, right here, the City of Melbourne, uh, the metropolitan, uh, sorry, the, the central city, uh, uh, City of Melbourne, has had a people's panel that some members here might remember, and that people's panel was set up to develop a medium to long term strategy for the City of Melbourne, five to ten years. And they said to the People's Panel, which was a representative sample of people from uh, citizens from a, across the uh, city area, including some people from business, so it wasn't just residents. And they said to those people, you come up with the recommendations and we will implement them. That wasn't an absolute guarantee, but what has happened is that they did come up with uh, some quite uh, significant proposals, including an increase in rates, uh, and that has been, the, the whole package, as so far as I can see, has been adopted and applied by the City of Melbourne, even since the, the last election, which has occurred since the first report. The other one is just over the horizon uh, from here in Geelong, and you may remember that the Geelong Council was sacked after a fairly colourful mayor, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't just due to him, there were a whole lot of things were, which went off the rails. And the state government said to the people of Geelong, if we select, a, if there is a representative panel of people selected to design the reform, we will accept and legislate that reform. Mm. And to the best of my knowledge, that is exactly what has happened. So it was government in both cases putting trust in the community, making sure that the community was equitably represented in the panel which made the decision, and then accepting the decision. I have to say that um, in media there's some really good examples of local community um, owning their own media organisation. There's also, um, and mutuals and co-ops are a model that's very interesting developing at that level. Um, there's the Howard Institute in America and uh, an initiative called Magnolia Place over also in America. And the, the, the complexity is who are the leaders in those communities. The, and who do they represent? And how do you get representatives from the people who don't normally speak up about issues that might affect the majority? So it's a really complex um, pathway to who those leaders are who feed back into government process. Mm -hmm. Can I just can I just bring Gwenda into it quickly? Do, how do you think that you can get um, the kind of more wider participation within the university sector into um, we're, we're talking about sort of getting a wider consultation. How do you do that within the university as well, around the types of initiatives that you talked about? Uh, with difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> um, open, open access is, is, has been treated with a lot of suspicion. Um, it, is, it is seen sometimes as a alternate way of, of publishing. There's a lot of um, questions around peer review, around um, the quality of the journals. So it is an education process, it is an awareness raising. The emphasis has been very much about concentrating on research outputs, the showcasing part, the um, excellence in um, research in Australia is a very dominant uh, thought process. Um, so there's been a lot less around the open education resources. So it, it really is an education and awareness building. And I do think that the university libraries can play a very important but you have to find the advocates, the champions in the faculties and in the academic divisions to, to work with you. We are finding those advocates, particularly among early career and mid-career academics, who are finding that open access um, is offering them opportunities to get their research and their scholarship out into the academic community. Citation um, being referenced, the material is much more quickly available than through traditional uh, publishing routes. So it is, it's been a very really slow journey. Mm. Uh, 
Um, I would have thought by now we would have seen a critical mass in the, in the movement around open access, which is why I made that open statement, is that I'm not sure it's been as transformative as we intended it to mm -hmm. be. It's this, this concept of deliberative consultation I thought was quite a nice one that somebody uh, was mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Right, I think we'll, we'll try and take one more question. I think we have this lady here. I'm going to go to Lady Victoria. Uh, I want to pick up something that we said, which is about social justice and access to information and life being essential. And something that Ken was talking about, which was using technology to make things available. In some ways, technology is now stopping people, the general public, getting things they need. I think particularly in Australian standards, where they are now sold by a commercial firm, which has barred them from being made available even at that price, through the state libraries, the national library, most of the public libraries, and yet standards are, in some cases, legal documents. You have to obey the standard. Um, so the desire for money has stopped people getting access to things that they absolutely have to have. Another example is that 30 years ago at the State Library, if somebody wanted to look at a particular medical journal, which we didn't have, I would have said, oh, go up to the Brownless Medical Library at Melbourne University. It'll be on the shelves there, you'll be able to use it. I can't do that anymore, because it's now behind, um, it's now online, only available to students and staff. And in fact, the new technologies have to some extent made less reduced the normal public's of op openness of availability of information for the ordinary members of the public. Yes, I think it's less about the technology and it's more about the publishers yeah. because they are reinventing the publishing models. Well, it's, it's actually a, a real tension. They haven't changed their publishing models at all and yet they have, because what they're doing now is what we call double dipping, mm. and they are what they are touting as making open and available, the institutions are paying huge amounts of money, invisible costs that academics are being made to pay for article processing charges. We're busy doing calculations across Australia at the moment, and we estimate that, for instance, at a university like Melbourne, we pay the publisher to provide the online content, if academics want to get their uh, articles published more quickly, they pay an article processing charge, but they pay it from their research funds. So we don't see that. As the university library, it's invisible, but we estimate it's probably $800,000, $900,000, and we're busy at the moment trying to establish exactly what those costs are. So these publishers are, they're, they're ingenious, they, they're intransigent. I, I can't, you know, have words enough to, to describe some of them. It's all about their shareholders. Mm -hmm. The CEO of Elsevier in Europe is the highest paid executive. It is only about shareholding. That is all they're interested in. And they are hiding these APCs or article processing charges in all kinds of guises. And um, I re we really had hoped um, there are initiatives in Europe. There's one 2020 um, driven by the Max Planck Institute. But until the reward system in the higher education sectors changes, mm -hmm. they are going to cha chase the high impact journals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the, uh, I've made this slide before, if you, if you haven't seen it yet, it's a film called uh, Paywall, which uh, APM screened last night for Bruce Springs Mail at the University of Melbourne. Um, there's some, if you're not completely outraged by the way things are at the moment, it'll make you more outraged. <laughs> there's, um, also, there's also one about Aaron Schwartz, the internet. One of the phrases that came out last night from the film is industry and publishers that have got inventive 